All right. Thank you for starting the recording. Perfect. All right. Hey, Ron. Hey, Arvin. How are you today? Good. 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 I hope you guys are having a good week. Hey, everyone in the class. Hope you guys are having a good week. Welcome to class. Um, so yeah, today is lecture four. Pretty cool. Um, hopefully we have better audio luck today. Um, before I start screen sharing and getting into um, our topic for today, which is really going to be um, a new edge detector called the Sobel edge detector. Um, and we'll also discuss um, maybe a little bit of Huff transform. Um, before I get into that, um, Rohan and Arvin, any announcements, anything from your side that you guys would like to share? Oh, one thing from my side. Uh, regarding the Python review session. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had the maximum votes for tomorrow. Okay. So uh, as you said, like during your free hours between 3.30 to 5, uh, we mm -hmm. can schedule a Zoom meeting for the Python review session. Okay, perfect. Yep, so let's let's chat or email about that and make sure we get that scheduled. Um, and yeah, we'll do that tomorrow. So for that, guys, make sure you just bring your questions. Um, I can generally talk about stuff, um, but we will record it as well. We can put it on YouTube. Um, but yeah, bring your questions. We'll make it, we'll make it nice and interactive. Um, and hopefully we can answer any Python questions you guys have. Um, and Arvin and Rohan, are you guys also available in that time period? If not, it's okay, but are you guys available? Yes, I'm available, Professor. Okay, great. All right. Any other announcements, guys? Uh, and one more thing. Uh, for students who missed the previous lectures, the recordings are, in the, are on Canvas. Uh, you can just access it from online lectures module. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yep. So we have all those lectures online now um, with all the audio blips and everything. <laughs> but uh, I think they came out okay. Uh, hopefully everything's intelligible and everything. Um, great. Okay, cool. Anything else before we look at our schedule and kind of uh, start at, started here? Let me go ahead. I'll go ahead and pull up the schedule while you guys are thinking. So let's see. That's it from my side. Okay, great. All right. Let me make sure I get the right screen share going here. Okay. All right, and let me zoom in just a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, so yeah, we've made it to Thursday. Um, so we are into our fall semester here. Um, you had a little bit of reading to do. I wanted you to look at the history of the Huff transform. Um, and I believe, oh, we, let's go ahead and update this right now, Arvind and Rohan. Uh, so we've decided to push this back because we're waiting on some industry partners. Um, do we have a date now for the adjusted project stage one? Is it it's a week from, from that? Is it the 30th? Or sorry, is it the 28th? Maybe you can uh, push it to Friday. On okay. The yeah, I like that. Okay, great. Um, all right. And we haven't made an announcement about that, right? I know we discussed it a little bit, but. Yeah, uh, we'll make an announcement as well regarding that. Okay, great. Okay, guys. So we are going to push this back a little bit, um, mostly because um, because we're having, it's just taking us a little longer than we thought to collect some of the industry partner information. Um, so I'll just put a placeholder real quick. I don't want to. I don't want to put uh, us on the spot to to say the exact due date. We'll we'll regroup after lecture, um, but this uh, will be pushed back. So you have a little bit of extra time on that. Um, so we'll let you know, um, and then we expect this to be on time. We'll let you know if anything gets pushed back, but we expect that to be on time. Um, but generally, we are going to be flexible. You know, we do have a little bit of a grace period on these things. But um, I do encourage you to start your programming challenge if you haven't yet. It's definitely time to get started. Um, we do not have the um, we do not have the uh, the uh, uh, grading server up quite yet, but it'll be up soon. But you can definitely start the programming challenge without using the grading server. Um, you, there's actually an evaluation script included, so you can uh, you can go ahead and try stuff. You can you definitely have everything you need to get started on the uh, on the programming challenge. Um, well, great. Okay, cool. So I think we can go ahead and hop into our topic for today, which is really going to be the the Sobel Feldman operator. Um, and then maybe a little bit of Huff transform. Um, so let's knock on wood collectively or do whatever ritual. We need some good luck today for audio. So uh, I'm actually trying Wi-Fi today instead of Ethernet, uh, which is shouldn't work better, but we're going to try it just, just to see, because Ethernet did not do too well last time. So, And then I, I can try switching mics too if we get into weird problems. But hopefully um, the audio uh, works well. So, so let's go ahead and hop in here. Um, so here we are in the notebooks for this, for this module. Um, and we are, we've just kind of wrapped up the image filtering notebook and we, we didn't go into a ton of detail on Gaussian filtering, but I encouraged you to have a look at that notebook and you're welcome to use that code, of course, in your programming challenge. Um, 
So here's the notebook and let me zoom in just a little bit just to remind us where we ended up here. Yeah, that looks pretty reasonable. Um, so yeah, just a reminder, you know, we talked about image filtering, wrote some filtering methods. Um, we ended up discussing Gaussian filtering. That's using a kernel that looks like this to filter our image because it makes things a little bit smoother. Um, here's an image of a brick and we talked about um, how to do different kind of processing on this. So um, here is our brick, the original. Here it is uh, filtered with what's called a boxcar function. That's where we just have this kind of uniform filter made up of, like this one is three by three, I think. Um, so it would be made up of the value like one ninth, for example, and it's just a local average. Uh, the Gaussian is a little more sophisticated um, because it uh, it takes kind of a weighted average where it centers the, the, it weights the center pixels a little bit higher. And with the Gaussian blur, we get a little bit nicer edges. Um, one thing we didn't discuss, I think we kind of glossed over this a little bit, um, is that the whole idea of blur, it's kind of a natural idea, I would say. And let me see if I can find this figure. Um, let's see. That's weird. I'm not seeing quite the figure that I want. OK. What I'm getting at here is that you know, blurring is something that our eyes naturally do. Um, and a Gaussian blur is, is probably a little bit more of a natural way to blur images. Um, it's probably a little bit more of a natural way than Oh yeah, why is that? Did I launch this from the wrong? Ooh, this might be a good chance to show you a bug. Yeah, so some of my stuff is not rendering and I think I know why actually. Okay, so um, let me just discuss something real quick and this is probably something more we would discuss in the review session, but let me show you something real quick just while we're here. Just a little tip on Python um, and on Jupyter Notebooks. So this video is not loading for me right now, which is weird. And I suspect it's a pathing issue. Um, so I just quit, quit my kernel, and let me try something real quick. And I'll share with you once I figure out what's going on. Okay. Actually, it's not what I thought. Interesting. Let me do a, just a quick screen share with you of how I'm launching the Jupyter Notebook, because it does matter a little bit. Um, so let's see here, screen sharing options. Close this. Okay. Cool. All right. So you should be able to see my terminal now. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So here I am, um, and I'm in my terminal, and I, this is where I have uh, cloned the repository. So you can see all my repositories here um, for this class. Uh, and the one that I've cloned is the original problem. So if I go into that repository, um, here I am. And the reason I brought this up is because some of the notebooks, the way we've set these up, um, if you if you change directory into notebooks and then you launch the Jupyter notebook, um, it's possible that all the visualizations might not render possibly. And I think we have this in the README, but what I'm getting at here is if you have any issues, I recommend launching Jupyter from actually the top level of the repository. So here I am, I'm in the, the original problem uh, directory. And if I launch Jupyter from here, then everything should render correctly. Now, the issue I just saw, I think, might be actually something else. Um, but I just wanted to show you that briefly, because it is one of those bugs you might run into. So um, there's a number of little Jupyter quirks that'll jump up from time to time. Um, so let me do a new share and go back to my browser. OK. All right, here we are back here. And if I go into Notebooks. Now, I think I did that right. Hopefully, I wasn't supposed to be inside the Notebooks repo. We'll, we'll see in a minute if the things don't, don't visualize. Um, but just giving you an idea of what you can look at if you have any, if you have any issues. Um, so we are about to do this one, but I wanted to kind of hop back to image filtering real quick. Let me get that going. Okay. All right, this is being very slow. Oh, there we go. Okay, finally. Cool. All right. Okay. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and hop into the Sobel Feldman operator. If we have any more challenges with visualizations, we'll, we'll address that. But here we are. Oh, no. Audio issues again. Goodness gracious. OK. Thank you for telling me. OK. So I assume my audio is still breaking. OK. Let's try this. I'm going to try something a little bit different than last time. Um, let's try the built-in. Oh, it's good now? How does it sound now? Good. OK. All right. All right. We will try that. OK. Huh. 
I don't think I actually changed anything. Okay, all right, we're gonna try it. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Just tell me if we have any issues. All right, so let's get into the Sobel Feldman operator. Um, so if you remember, we've done some edge detecting in this course so far. We've done, uh, well, let me ask you real quick in the chat. So we, we've learned one edge detector. What is the name of the edge detection algorithm that we learned back in lecture two? Robert's Cross, perfect, okay, good. And someone please throw in the chat window, tell me one problem with Robert's Cross. We talked about four, um, just, just give me one problem. Slow, noise, yep, great. Noise, 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 direction, yep. All kind of anisotropic, perfect, you got it, good, okay. So let me tell you a quick story, and it's about these guys named Gary Feldman and Erwin Sobel. Um, so they were students at Stanford back in the, in the 60s. Um, and they, they gave this talk back in the 60s, and this talk turned out to be really, really important to the future of computer vision. Um, the little excerpt that I'm showing you here, um, this is a, an abstract of the talk, and they, there's this really interesting line I want to show you real quick. So it says, this talk was presented at a time when the major piece of published work on computer vision was Larry Roberts' PhD thesis from MIT wherein he defined a two-by-two two gradient estimator and then referred to it as Robert's Cross. Um, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that Larry Roberts actually called it Robert's Cross himself. <laughs> that's kind of funny. That's a little bit uh, arrogant, maybe, <laughs> to, to call it after yourself. But anyway, um, so uh, the point here that I want to make is that back in like 1960, I think this is the late 60s, there was really only one publication in computer vision. Um, oh, back to audio. OK, here, we're going to try something else now. OK, hold on. Oops, okay. All right, okay, how does this sound? Any better? How about now? How does this sound? Same? Worse, 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 okay. <laughs> All right, so it's not a microphone, I just tried two microphones. Um, I see it sounds good to me. Okay, interesting. Um, right. Let me try one more thing. Hold on. Okay. Okay, how about now? So Rohan says headphones. So those headphones I had before, they didn't have a microphone, Rohan. I was actually using this mic over here. Okay, I see a lot of goods. All right, we're gonna try this. I think it's, I'm not sure if it's using this microphone or if it's using the one in my laptop, but we'll see. Okay, you say it's good, we'll try it. Um, some pops I hear, okay. If it becomes bad again, we'll try something else. Okay, some noise, some pops, mm, okay. Let me, do I have a question I'm gonna ask you guys? Because I, I have one more option I can try. I do have a headset I can go grab, okay. Um, so I do want to tell you the story, but actually, let's do this. So I'm going to go grab a headset. While I do that, please look at this question. This is our first question of the day. And let me just set you up. Hopefully you can hear me well enough for me to set you up. And then I'm going to go grab another headset. Um, OK, so here's an image. This is like a test image, right? Um, it's zeros everywhere, and it has a column of ones at the, at the index of 10, OK? Um, so the uh, what I want you to think about is if I if I filter this image with this kernel, and I'll tell you about this kernel in a second, what does the output look like? So while I grab my headphones, you guys take a second and think about this problem, okay? We'll open up a poll in a minute, and then we'll go back and I'll tell you a little bit of the background. So what will the result look like based on the filtering we learned about last time if I filter this image with that kernel? I'll be right back, give me one minute.
Okay, can you guys hear me now? I'm trying a different audio option. Loud and clear, okay, that's good, okay. So at least Ashish can hear me, that's good. Okay, cool, 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 okay, we're gonna try this. All right, excellent, good, we are gonna try this headset. Okay, great. So you've had a chance to think about this. Um, maybe let's go ahead, and you've had about 30 or 60 seconds. Let's go ahead and, and close this poll, see what you guys, how you guys did, then we'll go back. But I just wanna go ahead and see what the votes are. So um, I close this. So yeah, uh, cool. I mean, just so I'm talking to the right person, is, is that you Arvind or Rohan who's running the polls? Uh, it's me, it's me both. Okay, great, perfect, okay, awesome. All right, um, so yeah, so C and D were the most popular answers. Um, one of those is right. <laughs> cool. All right, so we'll, we'll cover the answer in a minute. Before I do, though, let me, let me go back here, and I'm so glad you guys can hear me. That is awesome. Let's cross our fingers that that continues. Okay, um, so what I want to get back to here is that, you know, back in the late 60s, there was only one paper out in computer vision, and it was Roberts, Roberts Cross, and these guys, uh, Feldman and Sobel, basically improved on it, right? So that's what I want to talk about here. So they gave this talk at the Stanford... Um, at the Stanford AI Laboratory called SAIL. Um, and the talk is called a three by three isotopic gradient operator for image processing, which sounds kind of fancy, but it's really not too bad, I promise. By the end of the lecture, I think you will all have a great understanding of, or at least a good understanding of how the Sobel-Feldman operator works. Um, and what I think is kind of cool, and it's kind of interesting about how science works, um, is that this quickly became the most popular edge detector in the world, and actually, in some ways, is, is still one of the most popular, if not the most. Um, there's an algorithm called canny edge detection, which we won't cover in this class, but if you do have to do some edge detection, you might want to look it up. Um, but I believe it uses Sobel as, as part of it. So let's get into it here, and I want to talk about why it became popular so quickly. Um, the reason was, this was just a small talk at Stanford, but because it was a new field, there happened to be like three of the uh, pioneers of the field in the audience. Um, and those folks were uh, Rod Reddy, uh, Arthur Samuel, and Don McCarthy. And I'll just talk about these guys just, just for a minute. Um, so Rod Reddy, uh, he's a really well-known computer scientist. Um, and at the time, he was actually teaching one of the first ones of these courses, one of the very first computer vision courses at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so he happened to be in the audience. So that's pretty cool. And the audience was also um, this guy named Arthur Samuel. So Arthur Samuel um, did a bunch of awesome work in, in machine learning, and he actually uh, coined the phrase machine learning. So when we say machine learning, we have Arthur Samuel to thank. He thought of the, the phrase. We'll talk about him in, in our next module. And then also, we had John McCarthy in the audience, and he is the person who coined the term artificial intelligence, right? So all these people were in one room back in 1968, uh, listening to a talk uh, from these graduate students, uh, Gary Feldman and Erwin Sobel. And in the talk, they, they uh, introduced this edge detector that we're about to learn. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? So a really cool audience, right? You can only imagine about giving a talk to an audience like that. Like, that's, that's pretty neat. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, let's talk about how it works. So when, when, when Sobel and Feldman gave their presentation to the group, um, it was actually, it's a group of probably, oh, back to audio issues. Gosh, okay. It really must be my connection. So Arvind and Rohan, we might have to do a little bit of debug and see if we can find a better setup. Um, yep, port problem. Hmm. So I could try doing audio through my phone. That's another option. Um, right, let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna make I'm gonna make one more switch. Oh yeah, I could turn on my video. That's a good idea. Okay, I have turned off my video, and this is just audio. Is my audio any better? Oh wow, did that do it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. All right, well, we learned a lesson. All right, we don't need video. Okay, great. Well, here we go. All right, so we are just gonna do audio. Please let me know if we have any issues. Okay. So imagine it's 1968. Uh, and we are in the room, and it's actually less people than are in this lecture, so um, which is kind of cool. So it's a pretty small group, but including these three uh, founders of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And Erwin, uh, so Bell and Feldman went on to present this. So they said, okay, here's how we propose finding edges in images. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to filter our images using two kernels. 
and they just kind of made these up, right? They said, hey, we recommend using these kernels. You use KX and KY. And what I want to do before we think about, you know, maybe why they chose these, uh, let's let's just do some experiment question. Um, so the first question I had you guys think about um, is what would one of these kernels, and I picked this one, I picked this first Sobel kernel, um, what would the filtering result look like? Um, and I think it was roughly a tie between C and D. Um, do you remember, Arvin, is that right? It was, I think C and D had the most votes? Yes. Oh, you can show it. Again. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's cool. You can pull it back up like that. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so C and D tied. Yep. So. Um, one of those answers is correct, and let's let's kind of talk about it here real quick. And we might switch to a little bit of drawing. Let's do it. So yeah, let me let me switch my screen share here real quick. Um, so let's see here, what I might do. Yeah, new share. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna hop over here so I can do a little bit of drawing. Okay, make sure that's coming through. Yep, great. Okay. So what I want to do. There we go. Okay, so here's the problem. Um, so what we want to do is we want to think about what happens when we slide this kernel over this image, right? Um, and a couple things will happen. Let's start by thinking about the kernel when it's right here. So when the kernel is right here, right? Let's say we're sliding it over the image. <coughs> when it's here, <coughs> let me just go ahead and ask you guys. Um, does anyone know, throw it in the chat window, what value will be produced by the dot product of our kernel and our image when the kernel is in this location? What do you guys think? What will the result be? What number? Yeah, I see a minus four. Yeah, minus five. OK, cool. So let's do the math a little bit here. So remember that all these values are one, right? So we're going to have a one in this location right here times minus one. So we have one times minus one is minus one. And then here, we're going to have a 1 again for the image value. And we're going to have a minus 2 for the kernel value. So it's going to be minus 2. And then finally, down here, I think you see what's going to happen. We have a 1 for the image and a minus 1 for the, um, for the kernel. So the result is minus 4. So when our kernel gets to this location, um, our, our, our filtered value will be minus 4. OK, cool. Now, what about when we're right in the center? Let me ask the class again. So when the kernel gets to like a location like this, right? What would the result be? Yeah, so Pooja, Thomas, ah, yeah, you're all saying G. Yep, cool. Everyone's saying zero. Good. So the answer is zero. It's because the, the part of the image that is ones, right, is overlapping with these zeros, right? So, so yeah, the answer is going to be zero. Perfect. I'll go ahead and put this on here. So this is going to be zero. And now finally, what about here, right? What about here? Um, so what do you think? What will the result be? Yeah, I see a bunch of plus fours, right? And the reason for that is that you have a one times one is one, plus one times two is two, plus one times one is one, and one plus two plus one is four. So the result there is going to be four. Okay, cool. So if you look carefully, you know, which uh, image matches that, um, that thinking? And the answer here is D. It's D. Because what we're going to have here, you see this minus 4 smallest value, right? OK. Um, and we see this column of minus 4s, right? So anytime the image or the kernel is lined up this way, which it'll happen a bunch of times, right? It'll, it'll happen anytime the kernel, let me use switch to orange, anytime the kernel is like, like a tier, for example, right? Anytime that right edge of the kernel is on the line, we'll get a value of minus 4. OK, so that's great. And then we'll get a second value of plus 4 here. So that's what we'll get when we filter this with that kernel. OK, great. All right, hopefully that all makes sense. Let me switch my screen share back real quick here. OK, share, cool. OK, application window, there. Great. All right, OK, cool. All right, so that was the first question I wanted us to think about. And remember, we're trying to figure out you know, what were Feldman and Sobel trying to do, right? What is the purpose of these operators? So that's the first one. And let's go ahead and hop to a second question here. And we have four of these. We might kind of knock them out in a row. So I have another chance for you. So if you got uh, number one wrong, that's OK. Here's a second chance for you to try again. If you got it right, great job. Uh, hopefully, you'll get this one right as well. So please take 30 seconds. Um, give it some thought. Um, and we'll open up a poll now as well. Please, Arvind.
Okay, take about 10 more seconds and we'll close it. All right, let's go ahead and close the poll, please, Arvind. Thank you, sir. All right, okay. So uh, the majority of folks said A, cool. And then we have some Bs and Cs. Okay, so let's talk through this one. And I don't have, I don't think I'll do a drawing on this one quite yet. Um, I think I'll do a drawing for the next one. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and talk about it for a second here. So imagine this kernel, right? So imagine, let's say it's like right on top of the line, for example, right? It's right here. Um, so what you'll get, right? So let's say, so the, 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 the line of ones goes right through this column, right? So you have a, a plus two times one, you have zero times one, and you have minus two times one. So the result ends up actually being zero. Um, and that's actually true everywhere. So the right answer, as most of you got, or 55% of you said, uh, the right answer is A. Um, hopefully that makes sense. If not, I encourage you to go back and look at it later. Um, this is definitely the kind of thing we may ask you on a quiz. Um, and what happens is basically this filter is kind of blind <laughs> to this kind of image. It totally misses it. It's kind of interesting, right? So start, start thinking about that, right? Because the, the main purpose here is not to have you answer little questions. Uh, the main purpose is for you to understand how the Sobel edge detector works, right? And notice that this kernel, so this kernel, this first one responded strongly, I would say to this kind of image, right? Um, and this kernel just totally misses it, right? So um, there's, there's something important in that fact. So let's keep going. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So here's question number three for you guys. Let me get this right in the center. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that's coming through okay. So now I have a real image for you, and hopefully you can see this okay. So we've got a real image. Um, and actually, can I, do I have the maximum width allowable? Give me one second. Let me go back to Robert's Cross. Okay, there's one little piece of code I wanna run really fast. And this will kind of show you something else about Jupiter that you might appreciate later. Let's see. Oh no, I don't have it there. That's annoying, okay, all right. I'm gonna try to figure that out while you guys are working on this. So let me go back to the question. Um, okay, so here's your question. While you're looking at it, I'm gonna try to figure out how to make this a little bit bigger, but I'll, we'll go ahead and open up the poll. And just to give you a sense for it, hopefully you can see it okay. So this is our original brick. Here are your five options. And you can kind of see if you look carefully, so there's like a yellow edge over here. There's a, a blue edge over here. Um, the scale goes from negative three to positive three. So yeah, take about 30 or 60 seconds. Uh, let's go ahead and open up the poll and think about if we filter this image with this kernel, um, what will happen? All right, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna work on making the display a little bit bigger. Sorry about that, but I did get what I wanted there. Now it's a little bit bigger. Perfect. Okay. All right. Take another 20 or 30 seconds. Okay, so it looks like we've closed the poll and we have a majority of folks voting for B, great. So let me switch my screen share here and I want this one I do wanna talk through. Um, so give me one second here and we will get set up. OK, 
Okay, so that's coming through now. Perfect. Okay. All right. So let's do this. Okay. Perfect. Two. All right. Let's zoom in just a little bit. Okay. So let's think through this one here. Okay. So, um, and I think the what was the majority answer again, Arvin? I think it was B. Is that right? Thanks, yeah, it was B, okay, cool. All right, so a lot of folks said B. So let's have a look, let's see if we agree. Okay, so let's look at how this is gonna kind of interact, right? So we have this kernel, here's our kernel here, and we're gonna be sliding this over our image. So let's think about the case where we have, maybe let's start to think about how this kernel starts to intersect with that edge. Let's say we get to kind of right here. Um, and what I might do to kind of help us think here for a second, is let's do, um, I'm just gonna draw a little fake kind of version of this image. Like what would we expect this image to look like, right? So if I took like this chunk of this image and I zoomed way in, what would it look like? Um, so it's probably gonna look something like this. Let's kind of talk through it. So the white regions of the image, right? The white regions. Um, and remember our images are scaled between zero and one and they're grayscale. So what pixel intensity values would you expect for the white region of the image? Yeah, one, right, perfect, okay, cool. So we're gonna see some ones like this, right? A bunch of ones perhaps, right? And then I know this edge doesn't go directly uh, left to right, but it's pretty close. When we hit this edge, what kind of values are we expecting to see now? It, get, it gets darker, right? So yeah, 0. 0.4, sure, definitely. I'm just gonna say zero, right? And we know it's probably not exactly zero, it's really gray, not black, but I'm gonna say zero, just for the purposes of our of our thinking here. Okay, so now what I want to think about here is when we get to this point, right, when our kernel, when our kernel arrives at this location, right, so let's say it's right here, right, when our kernel gets to here, okay, remember that our kernel is made up of uh, plus one, plus two, plus one, minus one, minus two, minus one, all right, um, and let me go ahead and put that over here, so we've got one, two, one, zero, 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 and we've got minus one, minus one, minus one. So let's take a second. Uh, let me go ahead and ask the class. Um, what value will we get when we do the dot product of this kernel with this image, right? What value are we gonna get here? Yeah, I see a bunch of fours, right? We're gonna get a positive four, right? And it might be a little bit less in practice because we know these aren't actually ones and zeros, but yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a big positive number, exactly. Yep, so when it's right here, we're gonna get a big positive number. Okay, cool. Um, so let's look here at our answers. So a big positive number in our image should be like a gl glowing, like kind of yellow, right? Like a bright yellow. So the best answer than the one that has kind of the bright yellow up top is, is this edge, right? And I want to put go a little bit further, but this like matches pretty well, right? We see like a big high value. Let's do one more little exploration together. Um, let's think about the bottom of this image for a second, right? Um, and I think I want to do that in blue to make it a little more consistent. So let's think about the bottom of that image, right? So again, let's think about the pixel values, right? So the values on the brick, right? The values on the brick are gonna have uh, values close to zero or close to one. Mm -hmm. Right, they're gonna be close to zero, great, cool. So we're gonna have like some zeros and then some zeros like this, right? And then, um, and then probably we're gonna hit some ones like this, right? Okay. And now if you think about our kernel, right? So our kernel is right here, right? So when we get our kernel to be like here, for example, right? What value are we gonna get out? What's gonna be the dot product result? Yeah, minus four, it's a negative number, right? What about, just real quick while we're at it, what about when the kernel is here? What will we get out? Yeah, minus four again, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Yep, perfect, cool. So minus four on this plot is like a dark blue area, right? And we see that this is like minus numbers, right? So this is definitely something I could ask you on a quiz and the answer is B. So the majority of you got it right, great job. Some of you didn't and that's fine. Uh, I'd recommend just reviewing this later. Um, but yeah, the answer is B. Okay, great. So I'm gonna throw one more question at you real quick and then we will um, kind of discuss what all this what all this means. Okay, so that screen share should come through, should be coming, no, let's see, come on, there we go, share. Okay, there it is, yep, cool. Okay, last question for you. So the last one in this line of questioning. So 
please take another 30 seconds. And notice it's the same exact image, but now I have changed the kernel to the other Sobel kernel. So yeah, if you could open up the poll again, please, Arvind, um, and we will keep this open for 30 seconds or so, and then we'll discuss. Okay, great. Thank you for closing the poll. And yeah, almost everyone got it right. Great job. Yeah. So the answer is the answer is A. Um, if you didn't get it right, don't worry too much. Just have a look at this later. Um, but yeah. So if you think about this left edge of the of the brick here, right? Hopefully you can see my mouse. Okay. Um, here it's kind of the same story as last time. So we're going to go from a very high value of like one uh, down to a lower value of like zero or something like that. And when we put this kind of kernel on top of that. Um, this will result in a high positive value. Okay, so that's that. Hopefully that all makes sense. And let's kind of start thinking about, you know, why are we doing all this, right? Um, and there's a little explanation of the answers. And I guess let's go ahead and, and have just a little bit of discussion here um, about why we think that Sobel and Feldman might have chosen these operators. So I'd say, you know, throw it in the chat when you have an answer. Here's my question for you. My question is, what are these two operators doing? Now that we've seen some, some problems, right? So we've seen a few examples. So in, in, in words, right, what would you say kx is doing? And what would you say ky is doing? How would you describe their functionality? Yeah, so a lot of folks are saying horizontal and vertical edge detection. Perfect. And so kx, kx detects what kind of edges, horizontal or vertical? Vertical, yep, kx detects vertical because vertical edges are going to kind of line up with this pattern, right? Okay. And then ky detects horizontal. Okay, cool. All right. So we talked about the intuition. And what I'd like to do now is go ahead and implement this in Python and then let's move forward. So I want to make sure you feel good about the code. So let's go ahead and get into the code here. So I'm going to import this filter 2D method that we wrote last time. Um, and I'm going to import uh, this convert to grayscale that was from the very first lecture. And I might zoom in just a smidge on my code, just so you can see it really clearly. Yeah, that's nice. OK. Um, great. And here are the two kernels. And I've, I've implemented them in NumPy as NumPy arrays. And here is kx, and here is ky. So we put them into Python. I'm going to go ahead and import uh, an image of a brick. Or I guess I'm not going to import an image of a brick. OK. Is that because of where I launched the notebook from? Let's see. So um, it's probably a little good practice debugging. So this is saying that there is no directory. Let me try something real quick. No, still not there. Interesting. So let me show you something real quick. So in, in the Jupyter Notebook, you can run PWD, which is actually really a Linux or Unix command. And it stands for Print Working Directory. So this is where I'm working from right now, Notebooks. And this is kind of telling me that there is no, um, there is no um, this is saying, hey, there, there is no folder called data here. Um, so let's explore that just for one second. Let's see here. Uh, I'm going to go back. I guess what I'll do, so you won't be able to see it on my screen, but I'm going to look at my file system real quick. I'm just going to go open up my file browser, and I'm going to go to this location, and I'm going to say, hey, you know, is this, is this actually here? So I'm going to go to that place I showed you earlier. Um, let's see here. Okay. So I'm going to go to that folder. Oh, there it is. OK, cool. All right. The original problem. Cool. All right. And there actually is a data directory. Did I launch this from the wrong spot? Hmm, interesting. OK. I might show you one more thing, actually, while we're at it, just kind of how I would think about this, especially if I was working on a virtual machine. Yeah, let me show you one more thing real quick. So there's, there's this great utility in Python called glob. Um, let's see if I have it imported. Uh, I do not. OK, so we're going to import glob. All right, so um, the current directory that we're in, so we, we're in this notebook directory. 
Um, so what I can do is I can do glob dot glob of um, so can I throw it in the chat window real quick. If you know who knows what this dot dot does, so um, if you know what dot dot does, throw that in the chat real quick. It goes up a level. Perfect. So yeah, interesting. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is I'm saying, okay, is there anything up a level? It's the parent, exactly right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this is what I really want. So if I go up one level, this is saying that, hey, there is no data directory. So that's really interesting. So I'm kind of guessing that I, um, I must be in the wrong location right now in my notebook. And I'll go change that real quick. It's not a big deal at all. I'm guessing that I have multiple clones of this, the original problem notebook. And this one does not have the data folder in it, is what I'm guessing. Yeah, that must be it. OK. And, and just so you know, if this happens to you, then uh, go to the home page for this repo um, on GitHub. You'll, you just, uh, you'll find the link on, uh, on Canvas. Um, and download the data folder and put it in this location. It's just not here right now. So what I'm going to do actually real quick, though, is I'm going to close this, this Jupyter Notebook session. And I'm going to navigate my terminal to the right place. I must have, like I said, multiple clones. Yeah. When I relaunched this, I went to the wrong place. Um, so there you go. Cool. So kind of annoying to bump into problems like this in lecture, but I, I, I kind of do like just talking through them because you'll see similar problems in your own work. So I think it's nice to discuss what the solutions are. So I just relaunched Jupyter, and I, I navigated my, my terminal to the right directory that has, see this data folder right here? It's right there. So, um, so we should be good now. So let's try it. So I'm relaunching this notebook. And let's scroll down. Oh, and the thing that I really want, yeah, 90%. Yeah, there we go. OK, cool. And actually, while I'm at it, let's just make this 100%. I'm making the width of the cells 100% to make it easy for you guys to see. OK, great. All right, so what I really wanted then, now we should actually have data. Let's see if all my talking actually got us where we wanted. Yeah, there we go. So the data was missing. You might see that in your own work. I'm glad that we talked through it. OK. So we've got this brick, and now what I'm going to do, let me actually ask you guys. So what am I doing here? What would you say in words? How would you describe this operation? It's not convolution. Good guess, Hernan. Close. With filter 2D, we're not doing, yeah, cross-correlation. Good job, Hernan. You got it. <laughs> Good job. So we're doing cross-correlation. And how would you describe this to your mom or to someone who wasn't an expert? You'd say, GX is going to be what? What are we doing by doing filter 2D of the gray image with KX? What are we trying to find? Uh, kind of. We're doing a dot product, but like this GX thing, right? We just talked about this, right? So, um, and let me back up a little bit. Actually, we didn't talk about it in great detail, but I said, hey, you know, when we do cross correlation, right? And yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this from Thomas now. Yeah, great. And then, and, Fadehi, yep. Mm -hmm. So when we filter our image with this kernel, we're trying to find the vertical edges, right? So what I would say here in, in words, you know, I'd say uh, this step is to find vertical edges. And I would say uh, this step is to find the horizontal edges. So we'll end up with, with two images, and we're about to show them. Uh, one that contains the vertical edges and one that contains the horizontal edges. So I'll run this cell again, but it'll make the same output. Um, yeah, and this is what we get. So when we take our, our brick image and we cross-correlate it, we filter it with our two kernels, we get an image like this, right? And you can see, hey, look at this nice edge. This vertical edge is really glowing. We detected that pretty well. Um, this edge is also pretty strong. It's negative, but that's okay. And then here, this edge is pretty strong in the horizontal edge image, and this edge is pretty strong. Okay, so that was kind of the next part of, of Sobel and Feldman's idea here. Um, and let's talk about what they did next. So the next thing they did is they said, OK, let's take those two images and let's put them together into one image. Because really, we would like to have, we would like to have uh, all the edges in one image, not just the vertical and horizontal separately, right? So to do that, they said, OK, let's square each image, add them together, and take the square root. Um, there's other ways you could do this. Um, but there's one thing I want to point out about the way that they chose to do it. Um, what do you think about squaring? Why do this squaring operation? What kind of nice thing does that do for us? Yeah, it removes the negative, right? So arguably, you could have done an absolute value operation. Um, but squaring makes it positive, right? So this will make all our edges positive. OK, so that's, that's probably a good thing. 
So let's get into it now. So we can compute our overall edge image by squaring and adding together our two separate uh, vertical and horizontal edges. And when we do that, we get something like this. So that looks pretty nice. Um, it probably looks somewhat similar to what you remember from Robert's Cross. Um, and let's actually make that comparison directly now. So I'm going to import Robert's Cross. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compute both edges. And I'm going to run this cell again just to make sure everything works. And yeah, here you go, right? So here's, here's Robert's Cross on the left. And here's Sobel on the right. And they aren't that different. But notice with Sobel that the edges are stronger, and it's going to be a little bit less noisy, so less noise. Um, so we've made some good progress. That's great. Um, a few uh, observations I made, right? It's a little bit less noisy. It's cleaner. Um, I think I have one question for you. Well, not yet, though, actually. Let's do a little bit more of a comparison. So here's Robert's Cross, which we discussed back in Lecture 1 and Lecture 2. And here's Sobel Feldman Operator, which is a little bit different, but it seems to work a little bit better. Um, and now. Yeah, I just want to have uh, one open question just to get you thinking about image filtering a little bit more. So we see that Sobel Feldman is a little bit less noisy than Robert's Cross. Um, any ideas why? Especially based on what we, what we learned last time, right? Why would you expect the Sobel Feldman edge detector to be a little bit less noisy? So I see larger kernel. That, that's definitely part of the answer from Abhijit. So yeah, good job. Um, can anyone expand on that? So it is, it is a larger kernel, certainly. Um, what else, right? Sobel Feldman might might remind you of something from last lecture a little bit. So we'll get into direction for sure. Um, horizontal and vertical, two kernels, true. Yeah, so, so uh, Jagadish said smoothing. Yeah, so you're really getting at something here. So this is taking a difference, right? It's like this column minus that column. But because it's a three by three, and because we have like the plus one, plus two, plus one, we're kind of doing a little bit of averaging as well. So like, if you just think about this column, it's kind of taking the average of like these three values, right? So because we have a larger kernel, just like um, just like Abhijit said, um, and then also because we're doing some smoothing, like Jagadish said, um, those two things together really make this a little bit less noisy, right? So we're doing some smoothing, and we have a larger kernel. So that, that makes our edge detector less noisy. OK, great. All right, so it's averaging and differencing. That's the thing I wanted you to take away from that. Um, so uh, just to close this up a little bit, we've done some good improvements. So we have a less noisy detector. Um, we haven't talked about this in detail, but, but the Sobo Feldman operator is going to respond better to edges in different directions. Um, one last piece I want to talk about, though, before we finish talking about Sobel um, are the problems that it fixes. So. Um, another area is direction. So we talked about, hey, um, Robert's cross doesn't give any information about the direction. So let's go ahead and talk about that here. And this was actually part of Sobel and Feldman's um, original idea, was that we can use, we can use um, uh, basically, without doing too much more math, we can find the direction of our, um, of our edges. So let, let's get into that now. And let's see if I want to ask you a question. Yeah, I kind of do. Yeah, I do. OK, cool. So I'm about, I'm about to show you how we can use uh, GX and GY to find the direction of our edges. Before I do, though, just take a second to think, um, how would you do it? How would you try to use GX and GY, these images, to find the direction of the edges? And when I say direction, let's, let's think about that for a second. Like, how do we measure direction, right? So we're about to get into a way to do it, but let's let's think about it for a second. So yeah, I see Monessa says angle. Yeah, so I like that a lot. So really, direction should be kind of like an angle. Um, and the way we're going to do it here is we're going to try to measure the direction that is orthogonal or perpendicular to our edge. So for example, this edge, right? Maybe the direction is like pointing straight out, for example, right? And this edge would be pointing straight up. This would be pointing straight to the right. Um, so yeah, we're going to get into some math. I see um, some folks talking about slope and tangent. Yeah, so we're going to get into a lot of this. Yeah, and I see Thomas says compare the strength between each pixels between GX and GY. Yeah, totally. Yep. So we're about to get it all into that. So let, let, let's hop in here. OK, and just, just to kind of get you thinking here, the cool way, or kind of a cool way to think about this, hopefully you can see this, is as, as vectors. So as we know, as we've discussed, you know, every single point in the image, every single point has a gx and a gy value. 
what you can do is you can interpret that GX and GY value as a direction in two dimensional space. So like GX is the X direction and GY is the Y direction. And if you think about, you know, what is a two dimensional vector? So a two dimensional vector has an X and a Y component um, and you can plot it with an arrow like this, right? Um, this is really what we're about to do. We're about to treat GX and GY as the X and Y components of a direction vector. So let's get into that more. Okay, so just a little bit of trigonometry here, right? So remember that we computed the overall edge image by taking the square root of the squares, right? So that was kind of the, the overall image. You might think about that as like the magnitude. That was our overall edge image. And we're gonna compute our direction just like we would compute the angle of a vector whose y component is gy and whose x component is gx. Um, so that's the math we're going to do. We're going to use the arctan, the arctangent, um, to find this, uh, this angle. One last little question for the group. Um, why am I using i and j here? It looks a little clunky maybe, right? Why have I carried i and j through all this math? What am I trying to tell you? Yeah, it's a per pixel operation. Perfect. Yep, a bunch of folks got it right. Good. What I'm trying to tell you is that we're going to analyze each pixel individually, and we'll do this operation for each pixel, basically one at a time. OK, so let's code it up. So here I'm pulling in an image again. Hopefully everything gets imported correctly. Yep, so here's an image of a ball. We'll do a ball this time. There it is. Um, and yeah, so here's GX, here's GY. We're going to compute them just like we did before to find the X and Y component. We're going to compute the magnitude to give us the overall edge image, just like we did before. And now we're going to do this. We're going to find the arctangent. Now I'm using this thing called arctan2. Um, I wouldn't sweat this too much. If you don't know what it means, it's not too big of a deal. Um, but just in case you're curious, I'll talk about it for a second. And I think a good way to explore this is to just look at the doc string for a second. So if I do np.arctan, so there's there's just a regular arctan. Um, and this is the trigonometric inverse tangent, just like you learned in high school. Um, and that's fine. But there's also an operation called arctan2. And let's see if the doc string is helpful. Um, yeah, so this is the only thing I want you to know. So it's the, it's the arctangent, just like arctan, but with this arctan2, um, it chooses the quadrant correctly. Um, we don't have time to go into it in a lot of detail here, but basically what that means is that if you have different signs, like for GX and GY, for example, right? Um, if you have this combination where they're both negative, for example, if you take arctan1, the two negatives will cancel and you'll get like a positive angle, where really you might want a negative angle. Um, so using arctan2 basically handles the signs and the angles a little bit better to handle all different possible directions. So if that makes sense, great. If not, I wouldn't sweat it too much. But just so you know why I'm using this function called arctan2, um, this handles the signs in different uh, quadrants better. Okay. Um, so we're going to compute this g direction thing. And I'm about to plot it. And it's going to look kind of crazy. So let's do it. So I'm going to go ahead and do an im show of g direction and it's going to look crazy get ready okay there it is let me zoom out a little bit so you can really see it uh, let's see all right there we go oh gosh that's not quite what i wanted to do give me one second okay that comes through a little better okay um the color bar isn't quite there i guess what i should really do let's just do this so what i really need to do is make my plot a little smaller so let's do that oops i typed in zero There we go. And I do want to zoom back in just a little bit so my text is still nice and big. OK, there we go. A bunch of work, but there's the plot. OK, so that looks kind of crazy. <laughs> Let's talk about it and think about how we could use this and how it might be useful. So this is that direction thing that we just computed. And you can kind of see the ball in there, but gosh, it looks kind of weird, right? Um, the first thing I want to point out is look at the color bar. So the values of our direction, they go from a little bit bigger than 3 to a little bit less than 3, right? Um, so throw it in the chat window. Um, why is that the result? Why does our direction go from, yeah, so Hernan, great job. This is negative pi to pi. So that arctangent function, right, this is going to return a, a direction. It's going to return an angle, um, but it returns it in radians, in radians. You could convert to uh, degrees if you wanted to. You'd multiply by 180 over pi. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be a direction in radians. So 
Remember that, that, that zero radians is going to be pointing this way. Pi is going to be kind of over here. Hopefully you can see my mouse there. Um, and 2 pi brings us all the way back around. Um, but uh, this is a direction. It's, it's an angle. OK. Now, it looks kind of weird, right? And I would assert that we're only really interested in the direction in the areas where we really have strong edges. And here, we're showing the direction everywhere, right? So a pretty common thing to do is to only look at the direction of the edge in the areas where we have a strong edge in the first place. So let's go ahead and talk through how we might do that. So let's have a look here. OK. So we haven't actually done this before. So we're about to do some thresholding. Um, and let me introduce you to the idea. And maybe to introduce you to the idea, before I use my interactive widget, <laughs> let me, um, let's just kind of get used to this idea of thresholding real quick. Um, so we have this image G that we computed that is the, uh, like the magnitude of the gradients. Let me go ahead and I am show it. There it is. So here's our, here's our gradient image. Let me make it a little bit bigger so it's clear to see. can't type today. OK, 9 by 9. Actually, I want to go just a little bit smaller so you can see my code at the same time. OK, so here's our image. Now, this is going to happen in your programming challenge, most likely. Is you're going you're gonna to want to just worry about the pixels that have high edge values, right? So let me do something real quick. I'm just going to try a little experiment. So I'm going to add a greater than sign and a 0.5. Just for fun. OK. Um, so throw it in the chat window. Um, what will this do by saying, I am show g greater than 0 0.5? Any predictions? What are we doing here? What's the result going to look like? So hopefully, it's only the circle edge. <laughs> hopefully. We'll see. That's, a, that's very optimistic. <laughs> uh, hopefully, only showing what matters. How would you describe this, this g greater than 0 0.5? Yeah, it's only showing pixels greater than 0.5. It's doing. Um, there's, a, there's a name for this. I usually would call this thresholding. So we're only going to show stuff bigger than 0.5. Let me actually ask you one more thing real quick before I, before I show you this. This g greater than 0.5 thing. I'm going to write a line of code, and I want you to think about what the answer is going to be. So I'm going to do np.unique of uh, g is greater than 0 0.5. Okay. Now, um, does anyone know what does np? Let me actually, let's back up just a little bit further. Um, so maybe you've seen np.unique before. Um, maybe you haven't. Either way is OK. Um, let me show you what it does real quick. Let's say I have a list or a vector or a matrix um, that has the values 1, 2, 2, 3, right? Um, so when I run this, right, um, what are we going to get back? So any predictions? What will the re we'll start here, we'll go here, and then we'll go here. Yeah, 1, 2, 3. It's going to remove the duplicates, right? OK, cool. Perfect. OK. So next, predictions. What's going to happen when I run np.unique on g is greater than 0 0.5? What will the result be? And I'm not visualizing anything, right? I'm just showing, OK, so no one has gotten it right yet. So I see some good guesses, distinct values, sure, unique elements. No one has gotten it right yet. <laughs> All right, OK, good. I'm glad I asked. This is a little bit tricky. OK, so no one's gotten it right yet, and that's fine. That's good. I'm glad I'm glad we're talking through it. OK, so let me go back here. So g is greater than 0 0.5. This is going to evaluate to a, hmm, actually, let me give you a hint. <laughs> yeah, let me give you a hint. So before I tell you kind of the answer, let me just call this uh, thresh, P-H-R-E-S-H, -E threshold image equals, OK? I'm going to give you a hint. Ready? I'm going to see what's the data type, right? Threshold image. So what is the data type? Ready? Let's see what happens. Oh, that's not very helpful. I think I have to do this, actually. Yes, OK. So we see the data type. What is this data type? This is a, what is bool? Boolean, right? So what, what are the possible values of a Boolean variable? 0 or 1. Yep, perfect. True or false, 0 or 1. Good, OK. So basically, when I do this thresholding thing, it's only going to return true and false. 
pixels where the value is greater than 0.5, it's going to return true. And for pixels where that's not true, where it's less than 0.5, it's going to return false. So let's go back to my question now. Um, throw it in the chat window. What will this return when I run this cell? What's the answer going to be? Yeah, true and false, basically, right? Because some things are going to be true, some are going to be false. But the thing that I really want to point out to you is that when you do a thresholding operation, the result is a Boolean, uh, like a Boolean image, an image that just contains true and false, or contains one and zero. Um, so let's, let's do it now. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more context. So I'm going to plot um, everywhere the image is greater than 0.5. So I'll run this. And yeah, so there you go. So those are the big values. So this is a, a matrix of almost all zeros. And it has ones wherever the image is greater than 0.5. So I kind of got lucky by choosing that threshold of, of 0.5, right? And, and just to pause for a second, you know, this is a very useful operation. I'm guessing that a lot of you will be doing thresholding in your, um, in your challenge. So keep this in mind. And the thing I want to address just briefly is how do you choose a good threshold? So here's 0.1. That's not a very good threshold, right? Uh, here's 0.9. Uh, that's actually better than I thought, 0.99. Uh, oh, yeah, still pretty good. Um, but what I want to get at is how do you really choose a good threshold? And again, I would encourage you to use this interact widget. So here I'm importing this interact widget. And I'm saying, OK, draw me a figure and just show me where g is greater than the threshold. So what I can do is I can run this. And here is a threshold of 0, right, which looks kind of crazy. Um, and I can move this threshold up. And this really just helps you kind of interact with your data, right? So I'm just kind of clicking through here. And I'm saying, OK, what feels about right? Um, I kind of like 0.55. That gets the edges pretty well. I could go further, but now I'm kind of losing the bottom. So um, being able to interact like this is nice. So as you're playing with thresholds and parameters, um, I encourage you to use this in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. OK. So remember, we had a little bit of a side of a diversion there, and that's OK. We were trying to figure out how do we look at our direction in a little bit more of a, a helpful way, right? So, um, so let's go back down here. Um, and what I want to do now is this. So I'm going to take this threshold. I figured out, hey, 0.55 is not a bad threshold. So let's use that. Um, and I won't go into all the details here, but basically I'm going to make an image that only shows the direction. And let me make this a little bit smaller so you can really see it nicely. Uh, let's do 10 by 8. Cool. OK, there you go. So I made this image where I'm showing, again, I'm showing the direction, the, the direction of the, of the gradient, or of the, of the edge, excuse me. But I'm only showing it at the points where I have a strong edge. Um, and yeah, I just want to—I wanted to, us to have a quick look at this, right? Because this is probably something that could be helpful in your programming challenge. Um, so here we see a value of like negative three, right? So a value of close to negative pi, um, and then it kind of slowly changes, and it gets kind of close to zero over here for the direction, and then it changes, 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 and it hops all the way back up to positive three. Um, so this is the direction of each edge, which could be could be useful. Um, and one just last little question for you. Notice that the direction of the edge, it has this kind of discontinuity. It kind of jumps right here, right? From negative 3.14-ish, from negative pi, up to pi. Um, does anyone know why does it jump? Why does the edge direction jump here? So it's related to tangent. Abhijit says tan. OK, let's expand a little bit. Going over pi brings it back around. Yeah, so right, Thomas. Good. Great job. So when we get to pi, uh, negative pi is actually the same angle as pi. Um, just in case you need a refresher, right, I would highly recommend just uh, you know go back to your unit circle. Um, everyone learns trigonometry a little bit differently. Uh, for me, I learned it in the, I guess it was the 10th and the 11th grade back in, in, in high school or secondary school. Um, uh, but uh, however you learned it, uh, I'm sure it's fine. It'll definitely work. Um, but yes, the unit circle, here we are. Is this in terms of pi? Yeah. So zero is to the right, pi is to the left. Um, if you go the other way, if you go negative, negative pi is also over here. Um, so negative pi and pi are the same. Um, this unit circle doesn't, doesn't quite line up with the angles you see here. It's just because of how we're measuring. It's not too big of a deal. Um, but, but here's how we can compute the, 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 the direction of the edges. The last thing I'll say about directions before we kind of put it all together and close out is that as you think about your programming challenge, right? So one challenge is to separate um, 
uh, uh, balls from, from bricks, for example. And maybe it's helpful to start thinking about your, um, your directions, right? So a ball should have a very like uniform distribution of directions, right? The directions should cover all the way from pi to negative pi, usually. Um, and for a brick, that shouldn't be the case. You should see kind of a spiky distribution of directions where you have, you know, a bunch of one direction then a bunch of another direction. So as you're thinking about your programming challenge this weekend um, or tomorrow, um, maybe this could be helpful, right? Maybe you could use the direction of your edges to help you figure out what's in your image. So just a little hint, there's also many other ways to solve the challenge, but that's something that, that might be helpful. Okay, so let's put it all together here, and I think we only have 10 minutes left. Gosh, this class goes too quickly. Okay, that'll be just enough time to get you thinking about the Huff transform, though. Okay, um, so here it is all together. This is the Sobel-Feldman operator. I recommend using this in your programming challenge. It's also still used today. It's very popular, so this, this isn't just old stuff. Um, that's a summary of it. I'll just show you one little image, and I think we'll go to Huff. Yep, we will. Okay, cool. So here's a nice little video. Um, hopefully that comes through. Go look at the notebook if you can't see it, but um, here are our nice edges being computed um, on each of our shapes, and I encourage you to use these nice edges to go do some cool stuff with Python. So that's that, and I, I want to keep moving quickly here because I want to get you thinking about the Huff Transformer a little bit. So we talked about Sobel, and I want to go just a little bit further because I think I want to try to leave us off. Yeah, we'll see if we have time. We have eight minutes. Let me just get you thinking a little bit about the Huff Transform real quick. So this is going to be our main topic for next time. And do think about the Sobel transform. Use this in your programming challenge. Start playing with it. But just to get you thinking over the weekend before we have to say goodbye for today, I just want to give you a quick introduction to our next topic, which is the Huff transform. Um, and this is probably where your brain is going to go, I hope, naturally, as you start working on the programming challenge. As we talked about finding kind of the pixels that correspond to edges, but what about taking those pixels and actually kind of fitting like real shapes to them, like really fitting a line, right? Like actually fitting a geometric shape. Because yeah, we found edges, sure, but we actually just found pixels that are edgy. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense. We found pixels that have high edge values. But really what might be more useful is to find kind of the geometric representation or kind of really fit an actual like line from a geometry class. So let's get into that. Um, so the person who first started working on this was this guy named Paul Huff, and I'll share the whole story with you next time. It's pretty cool. He was working on these cool physics problems. We'll get into that, but I just want to start kind of getting your mind thinking about the problem that he was trying to solve, and we'll come back and we'll go through this question next time. That's no problem, um, but what I think where I really want to leave you, um, and we'll come back to this notebook in more detail, um, I think what I really want to leave, oh yeah, yeah, here's what I really want to leave you with, just to think about over the weekend. Okay, so we'll get into this in more detail next time, like I said, but I just want to get this in your brain so you can kind of start thinking about it and percolating on it over the weekend. Okay, so um, the, so the, sorry, someone's knocking on my door. Okay, I think they're, okay, all right. <laughs> I need to put up a sign that says lecturing, <laughs> okay. Um, so the, uh, the thing I want to get you thinking about a little bit is that um, Paul Huff came up with this idea, and it was an idea to find how can you find lines and images like this, right? Um, and the, the idea is something like this. He thought, okay, if we take points in an image space, so here's a few points. Imagine these are like our edge detection points, for example. These are little pixels in our image space, in, the, in, in our image. He had this really interesting idea, which was, okay, what if I put them in a different space? So kind of what if I took these points and I represented them differently? And he thought of this idea, it's really creative, of going to this space we call Huff space. And to move to Huff space, what we really do, we take every point in, in our image, in our image space, and this point becomes a line in Huff space. So points become lines is what happens. So let me show you what that means really quick. So this is kind of the math that we do. So this point has a location, right? It has a location x, y, right? Um, and what we do is we take that x, y location, and we plug that into another formula. And the formula we're really using here is the formula for a line. So when you first learned about lines, uh, you might have learned an equation that uh, typically it's written y equals mx plus b, something like that where we have a line, and the, the slope of the line is, is m, 
and the, the y-intercept of the line is b. And we'll cover this more next lecture, but I just want to get you thinking about it a little bit here. And Paul Huff's idea was, OK, let's take our point coordinates, and let's map this to a line where the slope of the line is y, and the y-intercept of the line, where it hits the y-axis, is x. So let me show you that real quick, what that looks like. So if you take this point, right, <laughs> and you map it using this relationship where the 3, so the 3 is the y value, that becomes the slope. So this line has a slope of 3. So you go over 1, up 3. That's a slope of 3. And it has a y-intercept of 0. It intersects the y-axis at, at 0. So this point becomes this line, right? OK, hopefully that makes sense. We'll, we'll, we'll hit it again next class, too. But I just want to get this in your mind a little bit. This will be our last big topic for this, for this module. So I can do the same thing with this line, right? I can map this to, I can map this this point to a line, um, and here, you know, the coordinates are two comma two, so the the slope of the line is is two. I go over one, up two, over one, up two, and the y-intercept is two. It hits the y-axis at two. Um, so I can do that again here, and then finally, I can do it. I can do it here as well. And just to give you a little bit of context here, I kind of blew through the story, and we'll cover it next time in more detail. But what, what Paul Huff was trying to do is he was trying to find lines and images. He was trying to say, OK, which sets of points belong to the same line? That's what he was trying to figure out. OK, so we've done this, this kind of trick, this, this transform from, from uh, image space into Huff space. And let me just ask you this real quick. So these lines, or these points, excuse me, these points all happen to be on the same line, right? Does anyone remember the mathematical name? What do we what do we call points that are on the same line? Collinear. Yep, exactly. Perfect. So these points are collinear, right? Excellent. And notice when I map collinear points into Huff space, something kind of special appears to happen. Um, what do you see over here? So what's kind of special about these? They all intersect, right? So there's no guarantee that three arbitrary lines will intersect at one point. But here they do. So that might be significant, right? And let me show you a quick animation. We've got just two minutes left, but I just wanted to get this in your head before we, we left for the weekend. So this would be something you had thought about by Tuesday. Um, so here's an animation that I made where I'm drawing little points right, on, a, uh, on an image. And I'm actually doing the Huff transform of the whole image using Python. Um, and notice that every point becomes a line, right? And what do you notice here? Right? We'll play it again. So hopefully this is coming through and makes sense. So these points become lines, right? And notice that the lines intersect at, um, at a single point, which is pretty cool, right? So the fact that this happens might not be obvious, right? But these points that are collinear, they intersect at a single point. Um, I don't know how Paul Huff thought of this, but it's going to be very useful when we get to the Huff transform. Um, so the very last thing I just want you to think about, this will be our hardest multiple choice question for next time. I just want to leave this in your head for the weekend. Um, and this is probably the hardest math in this, in this module, I think. Well, actually, probably filtering is a little bit harder. But, um, but just, just to leave you with it here, um, I want you to think about how you would prove this mathematically. It's actually not too hard, but it does take a little bit of thinking. Um, so it seems like, you know, based on this animation, right, and if you kind of trust me, <laughs> which maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't, uh, I might try to trick you sometimes, but um, it seems like collinear points, when they're mapped to Huff space, will all intersect in a single point, right? That seems to be the case. So what I would like you to do is to try to prove that mathematically. Can you use mathematics to prove that fact? It actually is a fact, but can you prove it? Um, so here's just the example I'm leaving you with. So here's our three points, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3. Can you prove that these three points will intersect at one point in Huff space? So that's what I'm going to leave you with. Um, and please take some time. Go think about it. And th there is a proof you can do. It's pretty simple. It's just maybe you know five lines of math, something like that. But I did want to get this into your head before the weekend. So I promise we'll come back. We'll go through Huff more slowly next time. I won't rush you through it. But I just wanted you to get this in your head just so you're thinking about it a little bit. Um, so that's it for today's lecture. Um, hopefully that makes sense on the Sobel Feldman operator. Please do start your programming challenge. Um, and if you have any questions, please put them in Piazza. Um, and yeah, well, that'll be a wrap for today. We will see you guys uh, next week. Have a really nice weekend. Um, and let us know if you have any issues. Thanks, everyone.